There you go. There we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is welcome to Water Treatment, Water Academy Lesson 4, Conventional Sedimentation Processes, presented by Simon Brees and Brett DeWinter. This, uh, this course is accredited for ISET and FBPE, and the, the quiz, which I'll send out the link to, um, is mandatory, so please do take the quiz. And enjoy the training. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask the questions or type them in the, in the chat area. I'll pass Yeah, absolutely. Over. And then you can ask us questions anytime during the presentation. We've got a small group here, so let's just keep the lines open and uh, fire away if you have any questions or use the chat or uh, or if you're shy, just ask us later uh, offline. That's cool, too. So, um, yeah, we're here talking about uh, sedimentation, conventional uh, sedimentation today. Um, uh, it's going to be me and Brett. Uh, just to give you a, a context of where we are, we're walking through the water treatment plant from front to back, more or less, and we are on lesson number four of 18. Um, I'll just pause for a second and let Brett introduce himself, because this is the first time Brett's presented to you guys. Um, Brett, take it away. Um, yeah, hello, Brett uh, DeWinter from the Kelowna office. Uh, I've been working for 19 years in consulting on water treatment projects, so primarily water treatment projects, um, managing assignments and, and being the process engineer on, on water treatment projects. Um, worked on the Shaw Tin, so 1,200 megaliter per day project. Uh, it'll be some of the reference slides presented today. And then uh, wiped the way through to smaller, uh, smaller plants. Uh, you know, one or small referenced one here is the XL Food. So, and then everything kind of in between, <coughs> and provide project advisory services on a bunch of projects across Western Canada. When I'm not at work, I uh, yeah, I was supposed to tell you something about me outside of work. So when I'm not at work, I like to get outside and do stuff and play games and have fun. So, picture of me playing hockey. We. Uh, that team there stunk it out. We came second last in that tournament. We had lots of fun. And uh, yeah, picture uh, kind of canoeing out for holidays. So, you know, get back to you, Simon. Thanks, Brett. I see you didn't grace us with a video feed. Uh, you get Brett, uh, Brett's far too handsome. I guess all the women on the on the webinar would be distracted if we saw your video. So it's probably a good choice. Um, I, I all right, today's training. <laughs> Today's training outline, we're going to talk about sedimentation, as I said. I'm in a punchy mood tonight, so uh, let's go with it. Uh, I'm going to talk about the role of sedimentation and clarification in general in water treatment. Um, talk a little bit about theory, not too much. I don't want to bore you. Uh, and then really just focus on the different types of sedimentation processes and talk a little bit about design of the different types. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So what is sedimentation? Well, sedimentation uh, as a physical process in nature is, is just the act of settling. Um, in a water treatment context, it's, it's really the primary workhorse uh, war, uh, process in water treatment for removing solids. Um, and you're just really relying on, on gravity to take its course and allow solids to naturally settle out of the water and clarify the water. Um, its, its place in the process is uh, always upstream of filtration. Uh, in extreme cases, you, you might even have two stages of sedimentation. So if I've seen uh, plants uh, where if you have turbidity events in the, in the thousands, you might put even a pre-sedimentation base. And so it's like a pond, basically, that takes up most of the solids. But you know, most plants will have a single clarification basin. And the main role of that basin is to uh, protect the filters from excessive solids loading. Um, Generally speaking, we want to get the turbidity down below 2 NTU. Sometimes or as low as we can, but comfortably below 2 NTU will ensure that the filters run sustainably uh, without clogging up too quickly. And of course, uh, because your sedimentation process is taking out at least 90% of the solids, often in excess of 95 uh, or even 99%, uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of solids and you want to get them out in as concentrated a form as possible, ideally, because you need to then take that, those solids and process them somehow, uh, either on site or uh, send them off the sewer. But you don't want to waste water, so you want to try and concentrate the solids. <clears throat> so 
sedimentation, of course, as I said, is a natural process. It happens in nature naturally. It happens in a lake. Um, you'll naturally get settling in a lake where, wherever the water gets quiet and the, and the uh, flow velocities aren't too high, you're going to have solids naturally settle out. And that's been understood for thousands of years. Um, it, the Egyptians did crude water treatment, and the Romans, in, in their designs of their aqueducts, most of Rome's water supply came from the Apennine Mountains to the east of Rome. And, and they built these magnificent aqueducts, many of which uh, still stand today. And um, they routinely built sedimentation basins within uh, their aqueducts um, a, as a means of improving water quality before it got into the city. And so you can see in the bottom right a, a photo of a, uh, an excavation in, uh, in the south of France near Marseille. It's an old Roman aqueduct, so you can see the uh, the aqueduct popping in uh, to this chamber area, and then the depression in the foreground is actually a sedimentation basin. And you can see in the sketches in the top how they work, basically a little pond, little wide spot in the pipe, if you like, allow the velocity of the water to slow down and you would have some settling going on. Um, so it's been around a couple thousand years at least um, in modern water treatment plant kind of since World War II. Uh, or even since World War I, um, sedimentation has been in, used in, in water treatment processes, and, and typically um, those uh, clarification processes are what we call horizontal sedimentation, which is really basically a simple concrete box, again, doing the same thing as the Romans, allowing the water to slow down and the solids to, to settle out to the floor of the basin. Uh, in recent, more recent years, certainly since World War II, um, people recognized uh, the need for um, coming up with clarification processes which, which, which could produce more water in, in a smaller footprint. And so there's been a gradual evolution of a number of higher rate sedimentation processes and other processes such as flotation in, in the last sort of 20, 30 years, which now more or less dominate the industry in the sense that most new basins use these high rate variants the, the typical horizontal sedimentation I'm going to talk about in a second is something you rarely see built new anymore, um, but there's still lots of them around out in the industry. So, um, Well, I, as I'm alluding to, um, the basic premise of sedimentation is that particles um, hopefully are, are denser than water, and, and because of that, they will settle naturally in the water. But, of course, not all particles are created equal. Um, if you have mineral particles, things like sand and silt, sediments and so on, they tend to be quite dense in the region of two to 3,000 uh, kilograms per cubic meter, so at least twice the density of water. So you can imagine that sand is going to drop out fairly quickly, whereas if you have other particles, things like flock and, and uh, flock that's formed from uh, coagulation of organics or you have algae, um, those things are actually very close to the density of water, usually slightly more dense, but in some cases, like algae, it can actually, in certain conditions, become less dense than water and float to the surface. So you need to be aware of the types of solids you're trying to remove, and as we'll get into later, that factors into the type of clarification process that, that you want to use for your water. Um, the key point, though, is that because the density of water varies with temperature, um, generally speaking, sedimentation processes uh, don't work as well in colder waters. Uh, I think the minimum density of water is at 4 degrees C. Um, and so when you're in northern climates, Canada, northern U.S., Russia, wherever, uh, you need to factor that into the design. Make sure you design conservatively so that you can still get good sedimentation performance in cold water conditions. <clears throat> now, um, when you think of a sedimentation basin and water treatment, it's important that you don't think of uh, the particles settling discreetly um, in, in the same way as, as a, um, a bunch of marbles might settle if you drop them into a swimming pool. Um, the, the marbles, if you drop them, would remain discreet. They, they might bump into each other as they settled, but they wouldn't – they would stay as, mar as discreet marbles. They, they'd bounce off each other. They wouldn't stick together. But Flock is, is more complex than that, and so there's a, four discrete types of settling that go on in a basin. Um, when you have a relatively low particle concentration, you might see individual flocks settling discreetly, and they don't interact with each other, but as you get deeper in the basin, 
the concentration of solids will increase and solids will start to, to bump into each other. And once they bump into each other, they can stick together. And once they stick together, they, be, they become bigger. And once they become bigger, they settle more quickly. And so um, you get a change in the settling characteristics of flock um, when that happens, and that's called type 2 settling. When you have discrete particle settling, that's called type 1 settling. And type 1 and 2, and two are the predominant mechanisms for settling you see in, in a sedimentation basin. Once you get to the lower depths of the basin, you get into what's called hindered settling or type tree settling, and that's where there's so many particles now that other particles are actually slowing down the, the settling velocity of the particles. And so that's when you get into the sludge blanket in a sedimentation basin. And then type four is when you're really getting thick. Usually you don't see this in a sedimentation, but it'll be something you might see in a, in a thickener, which is kind of like a sedimentation tank. And what's happening in type four settling is that the sheer weight of the solids is so high that it's physically compressing the sludge around it and pushing water up and concentrating the sludge. So that's, those are the four types of settling you see. Type one and two predominate in, in typical sedimentation. Type three is something you'll see in the, uh, in the sludge blanket. So just, just to put in kind of a uh, experimental uh, context. Uh, imagine you had a sample of raw water that's been coagulated and flocculated, and it'll be kind of brown like it is here. And then you settle it over time, and you take samples from different depths, and then plot a graph where um, you, you take the uh, removal efficiency of solids at, at different uh, depths in the in the column and plot that against time, and you will see characteristic curves like this. And so it stands to reason that if you pick any one height here, I'll pick H2. Um, at, at H2, obviously, the higher percentage you want to get, the longer it's going to take. And that's really the basic principle, is that a sedimentation basin needs to be designed with a long enough retention, detention time that effective clarification can occur. And we're talking a matter of several hours, typically two to four hours. In a, in a conventional set basin. Um, so detention time is certainly a criteria. Another key criteria is what's called the surface loading rate, and that is the amount of flow that you put through a basin per unit area. And the reason that is important is because if you use metric units, it doesn't really work out as easily with, uh, with US units, but if you use uh, uh, metric units, you've got cubic meters of water per square meter per hour, and the, the uh, meter square kind of cancels out two of the meter cubed, and you end up with meters per hour. Meters per hour is effectively an upward velocity, so that's the net upward velocity of the water. And that needs to be uh, less than the net downward velocity of the particles. And, 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 and so you can understand for different types of particles, as shown in this table below, the different types of particles tend to tend to settle naturally at different rates depending on their size and, and other things. But um, things like lime sludge settle very quickly, very easily, whereas alum flock can be a little light and fluffy and is a little bit slower to, to settle. So you need to understand the nature of the solids that you're trying to settle. Temperature, as I said before, comes into play because that impacts the density of the water. And then also the design of the basin. But basically, the, these settling velocities more or less limit the effective maximum loading rate you can design a, a conventional sedimentation basin for, because obviously you need you can't flow upwards quick, more quickly than the solids want to settle. So that's a little bit of theory, just the basics. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about what we call horizontal sedimentation. And when I say horizontal sedimentation, I'm talking about the, the most basic form of modern sedimentation using water treatment basically a glorified concrete box. And so in schematic, it looks something like this. You've got a couple of stages of flocculation. And then typically, we'll have a perforated inlet wall. And I'll get into the reason why we do that in a moment. But the, the flow will enter the basin. Um, velocities are, are pretty low. You, you want the flow to be laminar. So it, it sort of more or less moves in a straight line across the basin. You get a minimal intermixing. And then as that flow goes across the basin, gravity will take its course. Solids will naturally settle to the floor of the basin. Clarified water will end up 
in the upper strata of the, wa of the water column and eventually leave via effluent launders at the end of the basin. Meanwhile, solids settle in the basin and are scraped, usually intermittently, by some sort of scraping device and pulled back to the inlet end of the basin where there's usually some sort of hopper and you can pump that sludge away. So that's, that's a, a typical said basin. I, I wanted to stress that this thing isn't to scale. And typically, this basin will be a lot longer than, than, than it looks in, in proportion to its depth here. Uh, usually, a, a conventional horizontal said basin is kind of long and skinny. I'll show you some pictures in a second. Um, I'll show you the same thing in plan because I really want to uh, explain some of the important sort of des design factors in sort of uh, in terms of laying out the basin so it performs well. Um, the inlet conditions are pretty important. I only show one basin here, but um, you never really have a plant with just one basin. You usually have at least two, if not in several. You know, it could it could be many many basins in parallel in a, in a large plant. You need to be careful of the inlet conditions to make sure that you have even distribution of flow coming into the basin. That's a common problem I see, particularly in larger plants. Somebody might design a, conven a, a simple uh, parallel walled channel like you see here. The longer those channels get, the, 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 the greater the likelihood it, that there is that you're going to get maldistribution of flow between one basin and the next. Um, it's something you need to be, take great care because if you get that wrong, you're, you're going to likely have more than one, one or more of the sedimentation basins performing uh, poorly because they're going to get more of the flow. Um, CFD modeling is a, is a really useful tool we use these days quite commonly to make sure we get that right because it's so important. Um, another thing you see here, and, and Bill Clooney spoke about this in lesson three, is that you'll see here that our flocculation basins are directly coupled to the sedimentation basin. So this is the sedimentation basin here. I'll just bring the labels. So these are flock cells, and here's the sedimentation basin. Um, you will notice that they're directly coupled across the full width, and that's to make sure we get as even a flow as possible going from the flock cells into the sedimentation basin across the full width and, and even. You don't want more flow going down one side than the other because that's going to set up uh, some undesirable pattern, pat, uh, patterns, it, it could scour sludge from the floor of the basin. So you really want things to look um, like I'll show you in a second. And we have effluent launders at the back end of the basin to pick up the flow. So ideally, everything you want is, is going to go through the basin in a straight line, more or less laminar, and then get to the launders, and each of the launders is going to be taking the same amount of flow. That's the ideal case. It's actually not as simple as, as, it, as it sounds, but um, that's really what we're trying to strive for, is nice, even flow through the whole basin. Uh, I'll get to some pictures now. This is, uh, and you, I had to go to Egypt to find a good picture. Uh, this is a said basin I designed in, uh, in Egypt in a place called Beni Swift, which is, uh, if I remember, about four hours drive south of Cairo uh, on the River Nile. You can see the River Nile in the background. And um, the reason we have to go to Egypt to find one that we've done is, is, as we'll talk about later, it's pretty rare these days in, in North America that we design a horizontal sed basin. They, they take up a lot of space. Um, but the reason, they're also mechanically simple, and that's why we ended up using them in Egypt, because, uh, um, you know, the operators there aren't, aren't as, uh, you know, well-trained necessarily, and so low mechanical content was, a, was an overriding principle in design. Um, and so these basins are very simple. Uh, I'll show you a picture inside of them uh, in a second. Uh, we didn't even put scrapers in them. Uh, just, again, to keep the mechanical content down, they, these basins were designed to be periodically drained, and they drop a sump pump in and pump the sludge out manually. Um, so just, just to give you a bit of an orientation here, uh, the flow is coming from the bottom of the picture towards the back end. Uh, at the back end, you can see uh, effluent launders. You can see six of them here, and I'm pointing them out. There's basically six long troughs with weirs on each side that pick up the flow. And then this, this uh, thing across the top is a concrete superstructure to, to support that, that, that those launders are basically hanging from. Now, you can't make it out very well in this picture. Um, you can see it as clear as day in the, in the Egyptian sunlight, but in the picture it doesn't show up that well. But if you took if you took this picture and kind of blew it up, you could you can make out there's there's a cloud of solids, and that's pretty typical. 
uh, if you stand at the front end of a said basin, you will see a cloud of solids because obviously it's flocculated water. But as you walk along this, this basin, along this uh, walkway here, uh, you will see the water clarify get clearer and clearer. It's not atypical, actually, uh, to, to see it get a little more cloudy at the far end. Um, and, and if that's happening, you have what's called a density current. And Brett's going to talk about that a bit later. But um, you know, ideally, if the basin's performing well, you're going to see a steady improvement in, in, in visibility and, and clarity of the water as you go from the front end to the back end, for obvious reasons. Um, here's um, one of those basins drained down. Uh, again, you can currently see it very well, but you can see there's no there's no scraper down there. Um, uh, here's just a picture of the launders, again, hanging from the superstructure, and you can see uh, V-notch weirs on, on each side of the troughs for, to, to get nice even uh, with all of the flow at the end of the basin and the concrete superstructure. Um, here's another shot of, of the basin, but this time looking from the discharge end towards the inlet end. Um, what you see here, if you, if you look closely, is you can see a concrete wall, and you can see a bunch of dots there in this nice pattern. And what that is is actually a perforated baffle wall, and um, that's what we typically do to get that nice, or at least try to foster that nice, even entry. Um, so you'll have a number of these ports, typically designed for no more than 0.25 meters per second, because you don't want it coming in too fast because you're going to blow up the flock. Uh, so you're going to keep the velocities relatively low, but you want to have a little bit of head loss through that thing to make sure that you get a you know, reasonably balanced a splitting of flow across that whole cross section, because you want the flow to come in in a block. You don't want it being all turbulent and mixing up in there. So that's a common way we would do it, is we would design a baffle wall. So the flocculation basins are on the far side of here. You can't see them. In this particular plant, we use hydraulic flocculation instead of mechanical flocculation, again, to keep the mechanical content down. Um, this isn't the same basin. This is a plant in the US. Um, I, I'm just going to walk through some of the types of scrapers we use. Um, and there are different kinds. By far, the most common is what's called a chain and flight scraper. Uh, you, and Chain of flight is what I showed in that schematic earlier. You basically have a, a two, two chains in a, in a continuous loop going from one end of the basin to the other, and then you have two sets, or you have um, sludge uh, rakes that, are, that span those two chains. And basically, the chain pulls the, the uh, flights along the floor of the basin to scrape the sludge, and then when it gets to the end, the blade flips and move, moves back. So you have this continual counter current motion of the two blades, one scraping the floor and the other one moving back to the start point, if you know what I mean. They're very common. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff down there. There's a lot of stuff uh, that's sitting in sludge down in the basin. Um, they're, as I say, very common, but also can be a little bit prone to you know, relatively high maintenance, because there's a lot of chain links and stuff that, that over time um, need, need maintaining. Um, so because of that, we've seen some variant scraper types uh, evolve. Uh, this is one. I've had pretty good experience with this one. I, I put the, these types of scrapers in the uh, uh, 600 megaliter per day or 160 MGD uh, Sinol water treatment plant in San Francisco. And we call it a super scraper or a reciprocating scraper. Um, what we're doing here is you can see on the, well, actually, two things. You can see the perforated baffle wall on the inlet. Again, a bunch of holes. Um, that's a nice nice shot of it. But I wanted to point out this shaft here. So what we have is we have a drive sitting up outside the basin that's driving this shaft up and down, kind of like this. I probably didn't need the animation to illustrate that, but you can just imagine. So this thing's moving up and down, and then this, this mechanism here is transferring that up and down motion into a forward back motion, and it, it's pushing these scraper blades here, you can see, forwards and backwards, just along the floor. They're staying on the floor the whole time. They're not lifting. They're, all, they're just on the floor. And what's happening is this. You, you can kind of just make it out here, but the blades are not symmetrical. Um, the, the blades have a kind of a scoop front, just like a snow plow, and then they have uh, a, a very... Uh, a slanted backside 
with a very low angle of attack. So what's happening is as the scraper moves backwards, that low angle of attack kind of gets under the sludge and the sludge flows up and over it and ends up in front of the blade. And then when the blade comes back, the, the scoop side of it pushes the sludge. So you, you have that continual forward and back. And so it's basically picking up sludge, moving it forward a little bit, and then the next blade comes back and picks up that and keeps moving forward. So you, the sludge is basically going forward in little chunks like that. And that's how a, a super scraper works. And as I say, they, they're, they're pretty simple. There's much less uh, equipment inside the basin, um, so there's less maintenance. Uh, you do have to be a little bit careful because um, they tend to be a little on the flimsy side. If you have a really heavy sludge, they might not be the best fit um, because they're more likely to just kind of bend under the under the torque and the pressure. So, uh, but if you if you pick it for the right application, I've had very good success with them. Another type of uh, uh, sludge removal system, I was going to say scraper, but it's not a scraper, is it's called a track vac, or there are different variations. By far the most common is called a track vac. And that, basically what you're doing is, is using vacuum to suck up the sludge. Um, so you have kind of a squeegee or a suction header that runs across the width of the basin. Uh, you have a carriage that that um, suction header is mounted onto. You have a guide rail, and this whole thing slides back and forth along the guide rail. It's actually pulled with pulleys. And then you have a vacuum hose. So you can imagine what's going on. You're basically just moving this, pulling this, this uh, assembly backwards and forwards along the floor of the basin under vacuum and sucking sludge out. And you can see a picture of, uh, of one here. I can't remember where this plant is. But you can, again, pointing out the main features, you can see the guide rails. There's one, two, three, four. You can see uh, the suction headers, one, two, three, four. And you can see the vacuum hose. Uh, this is pretty straightforward operation. Um, a lot of operators like these. I, I'm, I'm more negative on these than, than other more positive types of scrapers because um, it, it's, it's like a lot of vacuum cleaners. Um, they're, they're prone to losing suction if the sludge is too thick uh, and the, and the orifices on the vacuum get clogged up, you're done. There's no more sludge moving and then you got a problem. You got a basin full of sludge and um, you're going to have trouble getting it out. You basically got to you know, go in and drain the basin down and clean it out. So I, I'm not a huge fan. I, I, I do prefer a, a scraper type system. It's a much more positive way of moving sludge. Unless your sludge is very light, of course, and then these things can work quite well. Something to be, a, be careful of. So I've showed you a bunch of pictures of, of sedimentation basins. Most sedimentation basins are, are typically rectangular, but they actually come in a number of different shapes. You get circular basins um, relatively commonly, or, or at least square ones that, are, um, that have the corners rounded off that kind of act like a circular basin. Um, same kind of principle. Um, you can either get them where the flow comes into the middle, or the flow comes in, uh, if, if it comes into the middle, it flows to the outside. Uh, they also have basins that you introduce flow along the outside and it flows to the middle. Um, so th this is a center feed, so you'll have flow coming into the center well, comes under this, this center, uh, this shroud of the center well, clarified water flows upwards and outwards, and the sludge flows outwards and downwards, down to the slope floor, and then you have this rotating scraper mechanism which brings everything to the middle. So pretty, you know, same principle, it's just a, a different basin shape. In, in plan, it typically looks something like this. And I say typically because there's so many different variant designs, but this is a, a pretty common way it's done. If you have a square type like this, uh, again, you've got a circular rotating mechanism here, you need to put some sort of steep slope or chamfer in the corner here to make sure that the sludge doesn't all just hang up in the corners. Um, but this is the, the the reason it's typically done like this is so you can butt several basins side by side and use common wall construction. It's a little bit more efficient than doing this. And and, and this is the famous Shatin plant that Brett was talking about. Brett and I both worked on this and spent time in Hong Kong working on it. Um, and and these are truly circular sedimentation basins. And you can begin to understand when you see this picture why. Circular sedimentation basins aren't used very often anymore because they're incredibly inefficient users of space. There's a lot of wasted space in here. Um, 
so the interesting thing about the Shatin project was that we were hired to to basically convert the plant, actually bl more or less blow up the plant and put in a much more advanced high rate process. And so we took advantage of the fact that, that the design, the existing design, which is from, dates back to the 60s, had these horribly inefficient, space inefficient uh, clarifiers because that allowed us to go in and use that space much more effectively using rectangular high rate processes and we squeezed a lot, much more process uh, into the same uh, footprint. So fascinating project though. Uh, a few more pictures of different types. Uh, this again is a is a square type basin with a circular rotating scraper in the middle. And again, in in, in this picture, you will uh, if you drain this basin down, you would probably see some sort of uh, steep slope in the corner to make sure the sludge doesn't catch up there. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is actually I think uh, got the flock basins here. This is the inlet baffle. Um, the basin is actually designed square but has a rotating uh, scraper design. So, again, uh, something like this, if you only had a, a, a circular rotating uh, scraper like this, you'd probably get sludge hanging up in the corner. So it's something to be careful of. And then last but not least, here's, here's something that I, I would never want you to copy. Uh, this, this is a plant in the, uh, in the Charleston, South Carolina area, if I, if I recall. It was a number of years I, since I visited this plant, and, and I remember looking at these said basins and just being amazed. And it's not readily apparent looking at this picture, um, but this is actually a, a quarter circle shaped basin. Uh, the artist, I, I don't know what the designer was smoking that day, but he, he conceived a sedimentation basin which had one wall that was straight, the other wall that was curved. <laughs> and, and, and so it's like a, it's like a pie shape. Um, here's the inlet and then uh, you can see the effluent lawn is on the far end of the basin. So um, they they had problems with these basins from the get-go. Um, just the hydraulics of the basin are are, are awful. Um, and please don't repeat this. I'm just showing you that basins can come in all different shapes and sizes. It's hard for us in this presentation to really capture everything because there's there's so many different types of basins, uh, and some of them are proprietary too. So I've been fairly long-winded, um, but I'll just talk about some of the key design criteria for horizontal sed basins. Um, I, I spoke about needing at least two. You want to have at least two for cleaning purposes. Um, they don't necessarily need to be like duty standby, but at least have two 50% basins. So at a certain time of year, you can take one basin out for cleaning. That's, that's always good practice. Um, said basins typically are, I'd say, three to five, but they're almost exclusively closer to five meters and three meters. You want them relatively deep um, to, to make sure you have a good separation between the sludge blanket and the launders. And then uh, other key criteria, um, length to width ratio. You, I, I spoke of that schematic earlier not being to scale. You typically want, if you have a horizontal said basin, at least four to one length to width ratio. So you want them long and skinny. And uh, loading rate, uh, this is the key number because uh, this really fixes the area of the basin. You're typically looking at 0.8 to 2.5 meters per hour or 0.3 to 1 US GPM per square foot. And that's a pretty low number. Uh, Brett's going to talk about some higher rate sedimentation processes in, in a moment and you're going to see that this is a relatively low loading rate and low loading, loading rates translate into uh, large footprint and, and that's really why horizontal sedimentation is, be is becoming rarer and rarer because it just takes up so much space. Um, other key criteria, the detention time I've already spoken out, uh, about, you're typically talking in the two to four hour range. And the longer we're loading, this is the amount of flow leaving the basin per meter of, uh, of, uh, of weir length per hour. And you just need to, I, I forgot to uh, convert into US units there, but uh, that, that's something that, you know, you really just back calculate how much wear you need at the end of the basin to make sure that you don't have excessive velocity leaving the basin. Um, I think that was it. So uh, I'm going to pass it over to Brett to talk about upflow sedimentation and some of the higher rate sedimentation alternatives. Um, I'm just going to drag it over to you, Brett. Take her away. Okay. Thanks, Simon. Oh, yeah. Okay. Got that working. Okay, so Simon, Simon spoke to you guys about sedimentation and conventional uh, horizontal sedimentation basins. So 
talk to you now about some of the challenges with uh, with those kind of basins and, and some of the, uh, we'll call them advances or, or uh, variants of horizontal sedimentation used to uh, improve or address some of those those challenges. So, um, oh, I okay. So, upflow sedimentation processes. Uh, so the, you know, how does how does it uh, how has it evolved? What what's happened with uh, with these basins? So, sustainable loading rates, as Simon just mentioned, are low um, in the performance. So, you know, lots of places in North America, um, the water gets cold um, during the winter, and so that really deteriorates or, or declines the effectiveness of these basins. The as the water gets colder, the density increases, so the density difference between the flock and the water um, decreases, and the performance uh, uh, decreases. But conversely, in the summer, um, you get into these uh, thermal effects. You get this large body of water, large basin of water, and it can start to stratify, and then that will also uh, negatively impact uh, your basins because it creates the hydraulic currents that uh, you know can remobilize or disrupt uh, the flock. So some of the ways these issues have been, uh, you know, tried to be mitigated is through the uh, use of uh, plates or tubes to really define the flow patterns through the basins. And then the, the other kind of uh, advancement that happened with uh, conventional sedimentation is the use of solid contact clarifiers or some kind of a, a ballasted type uh, clarifier. So not we won't talk about high rate ballasted flocculation, but uh, just kind of some of the variants of conventional sedimentation that used to of ballast or, or solid contact. So the... Uh, <clears throat> The density current issue. Um, so as Simon showed you the picture there of say the basin in Egypt, it's a large body of water and it's uh, situated out, out, usually uh, outside and when the sun shines on that body of water the uh, the surface will warm and that warm warming uh, um, section of water, warm section of water can, can increase as shown here. As it gets larger and larger then you start to drive the water down. I think there's another um, uh, colder water. That's usually the process water coming in um, is colder. It goes to the bottom of the basin underneath this pocket of warm water. And then you get can get in a situation where you're actually remobilizing sludge that's already settled on the bottom. And you're also short circuiting the flow through the basin. So your ability to effectively settle or uh, with the with the retention time in the basin is impacted. And then you start mobilizing sludge straight out the effluent launders, which will uh, negatively impact your your uh, downstream process, your, your filtration, right, which you're trying to protect from the uh, um, loading of, of block. So, oh, yeah, sorry. The, uh, so in the other situation um, that you also have to be aware of is the direct opposite. So when the sun goes down, then the, uh, the cool water will start to go along the top, and then you could end up with a, a flip. Like it will get warm, warm, cold water on the top, and it'll be more dense, and then it will actually um, fairly quickly get into a, a flip or a mix as the warm water is trapped underneath. And that can, again, mobilize a significant amount of sludge off the bottom that will then go uh, out the affluent uh, rear. So, um, you know, this whole management of, of the exposure of a large basin to sunlight and the and the kind of the impact of the varying temperatures during the course of a day is a major design consideration that needs to be addressed and a shortcoming really of, of that large conventional sedimentation. One of the things done to increase the loading rate and uh, you know kind of define the hydroxyl basin is the addition of of plates. So they can be in the form of lamella plates, stainless steel lamella plates like this picture shows, or some kind of a tube of, of some fashion. So this is a, you know, a high density polyethylene um, tube, like an A crate almost. Um, you can get, you know, actually PVC tubes that are put together in a four inch diameter often that are strapped together and, and positioned to, uh, you know, to find that flow pattern through the through the base. So all these, all these things are kind of a the same theory, which is um, in reducing the settling uh, length required and, and improving the effective area of the basin, resulting in a, a 
improve based on performance and, and improve the effective area of the, of the settling zone. So yeah, these come in, as we've shown here, the schematic, they, they, these uh, can come in all different shapes and sizes, but the key is uh, increasing the effective area of the basin. So the so Simon showed you before the graph or the kind of as, as time goes up and as, as the depth of basin increases, so depth is here, time here, your, your effective removal or settling will, will increase, right? Um, so a way to mitigate or kind of improve this is to uh, be like good engineers and find where the slope of the curve starts to, uh, starts to decrease. And so if you put in a little mini clarifier, so to speak, or a lamella plate in the bigger basin with uh, with a height in uh, in this order, you can get 80% um, removal um, without having to uh, have the same uh, same basin depth as you would as you would have uh, normally. Um, so this is really the the kind of the, the science or the theory behind uh, the implementation of, of lamella plates in a, in a horizontal set basin. So here's a, a schematic or a kind of a illustration of the lamella plate or a tube settler and how it works. So the, the flock, the water comes up between the plates this way. The flock then, so if you have a uh, flock within this water, um, it then has to settle this, this short distance between the plate and then will slide down the plate and then get collected in the bottom of the basin. So you're really, you're, you're yeah, again, defining the hydraulic flow and, and enhancing the opportunity for the flock to settle and, and be separated from, from the water. The spacing of the plate, so that, uh, that really um, is very typically uh, two inches or, or five centimeters. Um, it can be increased upwards of, uh, say, three, three inches is Kind of 75 centimeters is really a, like an upper limit, and that that's something that design consideration, something you need to work out with the vendor, and is a function of the raw water quality coming into the basin. If uh, if you have large sediment load, large large amount of turbidity that needs to be removed, um, you're going to have more flock in this space, and you you maybe would benefit from a or be, have beneficial performance from a from a wider space in the in the sedimentation. Uh, yeah, or in, sorry, in between the lamella plates. Um, typically, typical kind of water, uh, you know, kind of like 500 NT or less, um, you know, a two inch spacing would be just fine. If you start to get into very, uh, very turbid sources or, or sources that have uh, high turbidity events in the, in the freshet, um, you, you might want to consider uh, a wider spacing between the plates. The, the other, Part of these plates is the uh, the angle uh, of the plate. And so typical is 60 degrees from the horizontal. Um, you can also uh, it won't be uncommon to see a 50 degree angle. Um, the the flatter the angle, the uh, the less prone or less less able the sludge is to slide down the plate, um, and then uh, and then get uh, you know drop down in the bottom for other basin for removal. So the, the and you know, as as mentioned by Simon, the, the flock is typically kind of sticky, as we, as we have in all these water plants, some kind of alum or, or flowing room chloride flock. It's, it's somewhat sticky. So if you get these plates too flat, um, the flock can tend to stick on it, and then it won't slide, and it'll be difficult to remove. And it becomes a maintenance issue. It's something you have to hose off or spray down to kind of uh, push it down to the bottom of the basin. But as you go with a Flatter plate, your effective area increases. So, you know, if you have a very high quality water, um, maybe you'd want to consider, and not room really a large large volume of solids, maybe you'd want to consider a, a flatter a flatter plate angle. But you know, typical is a is a 60 degree angle because that's really a proven uh, proven design where the sludge will tend to slide down the plate uh, and be somewhat maintenance uh, lower maintenance. So yeah, the whole deal with the plates, the number of plates, and the kind of angle of plates is all about 
improving the effective area of the basin. You can see from this uh, this little schematic here, um, you can do your uh, your angles back from uh, high school math here. You can determine based on the height of the plate and the angle of the plate, the actual horizontal area or effective area that's uh, available to you to, uh, um, to to do your calculation for the effective uh, loading rate on the basin. So that um, that is really a total of all these different horizontal areas divided by the, the flow through the basin. So yeah, and the more plates, so you know, the closer the space together, and the uh, the flatter the angle, the higher the effective uh, effective area. But it's it's all about a balance of you know a overall basin performance related to the removal of, of flock and the and the kind of maintenance required to have these things function sustainably. So yeah, things you need to think about during the design. But again, the typical. Um, approach is a two-inch spacing with a 60-degree 60, uh, 60 degree angle. <clears throat> so another um, important part of you know the whole addition of lamella plates and you know with a focus on improving the the loading rate on the basin and the quality and consistency of the quality of the clarified water leaving the leaving the basin is getting the hydraulics right. So just like Simon mentioned, uh, you need you know, the flow split going into um, each basin is very important. The, the, the flow split within the, within the lamell plates is also very important. So there's a few different ways this is, this is accomplished. Um, some, some vendors use a, a B-notch weir on the top and then all these weirs are, are balanced and set. Other, other vendors use an actual plate or uh, or a space between the plate to lim to limit the actual flow or create a bit of a head loss as the, as the water comes through between the plates. There's a little groove cut, or or actual holes drilled in orifices to, to kind of balance the flow between um, uh, each one of these little uh, mini clarifiers, so to speak, or in between each each uh, lamell plate. So once the water gets into the plate. It's really a function of the the kind of removal mechanism at the top, and then you got to get you got to consider how you're going to get water from from the uh, from the flocculator, typically over uh, uh, over a wall, and then there'd be some kind of a underflow baffle here, and then you want to design all that so you're not remobilizing sludge, and also uh, being able to come in with a nice even loading rate. Into uh, or across the uh, the front of the plate, so you can get even hydraulic loading into the into these uh, plates and good effective performance. So, again, key design consideration is kind of that transition from the flock basin and uh, having sufficient space for a good even flow into the lamell plates. <clears throat> so, yeah, you can see clarified water goes up. And then the sludge kind of comes down these plates and then goes down to the bottom of the basin for, for removal. So, yeah, the, the schematic uh, of, of a kind of traditional uh, sedimentation basin, so I think Simon showed this earlier, without the lamella plates in it. So now with lamella plates, here's this uh, underflow wall that you'd need. So the water will come out of the population basin, come down into the uh, into the uh, basin here, and then and then up into the lamella plate. So, the design of, of this, and then the, the spacing here, and really the amount of sludge that you need to remove. You need to you need to design your sludge removal system based on how much sludge you'll expect to have accumulated here. You don't want to have flow coming down here and resuspending sludge and carrying it up into your effluent launders because you can't remove it quick enough, or you didn't leave enough space in, in here for, for sludge removal as well as the passage of water. Um, down into the lamella plate. So um, you always want to pull the sludge back to the back end here and remove it uh, through some kind of hopper in a, in a positive manner. <clears throat> so here's a picture of, uh, and the thing to highlight here is really the materials of construction and the importance of materials of construction. So. This is the, it's hard to tell from this picture, but this is a, a part of the uh, the big circular uh, um, 
clarifiers that Simon showed earlier from the Hong Kong uh, Cha Tin plant. And one of the, one of, this is one section of it where they, they were retrofitted, they, all these clarifiers were retrofitted with, uh, with uh, you know, what is a, is a high density polyethylene uh, um, package for the kind of creation of, of lamella, of lamella tubes or her, uh, the tube settlers. And then removed off the top here, or at the top is the uh, removal mechanism for the collection of the clarified water. And so something that happened here was, um, you know, not, not anything we were a part of, but that's kind of a story we heard. <laughs> Thank goodness we weren't part of it. But the, this PVC pipe sitting up here in the sunlight um, was subject to deterioration and, you know, they had situations where a few of these fell apart. And then the algae growth, so it's a nice, Clear, clear area here and all these nice PVC uh, um, um, uh, tube settlers are there and the algae grew on it and grew so badly and, and became so heavy that they had sections of these collapse. So if you have a basin where you're, where you're retrofitting or you're gonna be putting in some kind of mechanism to help optimize or improve clarification, you gotta, you gotta think about what, what you're doing and, and how it's gonna be how it's going to function long term. So, you know, something where it, the the new basins we designed were all stainless steel lamella plates and far more robust, and they're going to be exposed to sunlight as well, and it will be something far more durable. And yeah, this the stainless steel kind of lamella plate system we ended up designing was such that you know it was basically a plate on top with little orifices, so the ability for sunlight to kind of penetrate down into a, a big body of water like this. And, and just be beautiful the conditions for growing algae won't won't exist in the in the new design. So, you know, these are things that you need to think about when you're uh, when you're designing a, a clarifier, especially something that's going to be in warm conditions outside. Um, yeah, conversely, I guess if this was in the winter and uh, subject to ice, it'd be similar situations. But so make sure you consider what you're doing and, and the impacts operationally to how it, how it will function. So here's an example of installed lamella plates. Um, these these plates come in, in sections, like package package sections typically. So this would be one and then they kind of get bolted together and put to, assembled in, into the basin. Um, so these ones here, you can see this is a, a V-notch weir along so the water will come up between the plates and then come over um, and, and get down in through the V-notch weir. So this the V-notch weir is really the mechanism that's used to balance the load through the through the lamella plates, and then collected in this uh, in this launder, and then sent off here to this uh, trough for for the processing through filtration. So another variant of sedimentation, horizontal sedimentation, is a salt contact clarifier. Uh, there's lots of these things uh, around North America. They were very popular uh, kind of like 20 years ago-ish. Um, and they, they were all they were focused on, kinda, you know, retaining sludge in the basin and then having the, the flocculated water come through this, this blanket of sludge and through the contact of, of the, the flocculated water with the sludge and kind of enhance the, the removal of flock from the water. The water would come into the uh, come into the middle here and then get into this mixing zone where you retain sludge and then and then the water would continue to clarify and move upward through the outer reaches or sorry the outer outer rim of, of the uh, of the salt contact clarifier and then there'd be some kind of a either an excellent weir or, or a launder kind of uh, across the, this part of the clarified zone of the, the clarification zone of the, of the salt contactor and then remove through the uh, effluent weir and off into the off for till for filtration. So the, the issue with this is the operator needs to maintain the right amount of sludge in the in the contact zone and so that's that's reasonable thing to do if your flow through your basin or through your clarifier doesn't change and if the raw water quality doesn't change much um, if you get any variation in raw water quality you get more solids less solids 
then your kind of removal of salts um, can become either you don't have enough salts to make it work or you have too much salts and then you start getting salts kind of burping out or kind of being released and uh, ending up in your effluent. So, you know, a real, real, ch these are work well. They, they still get used from time to time um, in, in lime, lime softening. Uh, or like in some kind of a, a mining site type approach where where you're 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 doing a pH adjustment with uh, with with the lime kind of contactor, um, so you got like like nice consistent even conditions that uh, you know you set it and it runs and it, and you don't have to worry about kind of balancing out sludge loading versus uh, versus flow through the basin. Then then these things can still be used and still effective, but for a, a clarifier. On a variable potable water source, you, you don't see these uh, these used very often. And often, if you do get called out to a site or there's a media client with one of these, um, more often than not, it's the operator pulling his hair out trying to, you know, retain the right amount of sludge in this uh, reaction zone and actually get good clarified water going through his downstream filter. So, um, yeah. If you ever get called out to site, uh, first thing you do is ask the operator how he goes about maintaining the sludge in the in the reaction zone. And often he's doing it by by gas work and struggling dreadfully. Okay. So another variant is this uh, uh, super pulsator or pulse blanket clarifier. Um, it's a bunch of automation here, so I'll try and so they. they I'll, yeah, just explain it first, and then just flip through the automation. So the the key, the the kind of concept here is is somewhat similar. So you retain sludge in the in the bottom of the basin. Um, the the coagulated water enters in through the bottom, and then you have the coagulated water go through the sludge. You get that uh, kind of contact again, sludge contact, um, and and using that to optimize the removal of flock from the from the coagulator or flocculated water. And then that water continues to migrate upward and get removed. You can put lamella plates on the top of the basin or just some kind of effluent launder and collect the clarified water off the top and then off, off to filtration. And then in addition to, to that kind of the, the sludge blanket and the contact, you actually pulse the water through and you do that through this chamber. And uh, you know, usually it's a, a, a vacuum and it's used to then um, release uh, discrete segments of water into, into Basin and again optimize the performance of it. Challenge with this is it's got all these mechanical bits and pieces to it, um, far more than, than most other kind of typical uh, clarification processes, and yet you don't get the really high performance that you would get from a, from a DAF or an active flow or that kind of basin. So you know, the, it's mechanically complex with, uh, with kind of marginal upside. And then you do its big base, and then this whole management of the sludge blanket again, just like the solids contact clarifiers, become very, very complicated and can be, can result in, in poor performance. Um, the benefit of this is that they, there's kind of this typically a weir here of some sort, and so as the sludge builds up, it actually flows over into the hopper and then gets removed. So it's, it's a little more definable or manageable kind of sludge blanket in the bottom, but still prone to kind of process upsets and resulting in sludge going over the over the effluent weir and off and off on the filters. So we'll kind of flip through the uh, automation here. And show how it works. So hopefully that'll make sense to people. There we go. So here's a picture of a super pulsator clarifier. Um, so you can see the, uh, well, I don't know if you can or not, but anyhow, there's there's uh, kind of plates underneath and then water kind of entering in from the from the bottom of this. So, um, you know, the, the, the launders on the top here are collecting clarified water and then, and then kind of carrying it away. Um, so one thing you can see here, you can actually see some sludge on the top of these launders. So this basin was subject to uh, to a bunch of 
they would have frequently had process upsets and resulting in sludge kind of sludge blanket actually uh, um, uh, ending up on the top of the basin and uh, sludge accumulating on top of the laundry chair. And this project was subsequently uh, retrofitted and it was a project that Simon actually worked on. But you know, the point here is like the you know these basins aren't without their challenges. And here's a good example of where there's actually sludge up here on the top of the launders, and obviously that sludge was getting carried away and, and going down to the filters and impacting the performance of the plant. You just need to yeah, be aware of your application, and you know if you're ever going to put one of these in, be very certain on kind of the design, the design parameters and the operating parameters around it. So the kind of horizontal sedimentation basin, so you know, if you're doing it for turbidity removal only, um, you can tip a typical loading rate would be one and a half to two meters an hour. If you're looking at color and taste and odor, you're going to have to drop that a little bit. Um, a, a color flock is going to be uh, far far lighter and fluffier than a, than a flock that's that's contain contains primarily particulate matter. And again, if you have algae, you're going to have to drop that loading rate even further um, for a conventional sedimentation basin. So. You know, and we're talking like a, basically a meter and a half an hour is a rough term for sedimentation. That's a, that results in, as you saw from some of the pictures Simon showed, very large, very, very large basins um, that are going to be expensive to build and, and then provide marginal performance based on all the other external factors that you can't really control, like temperature and sunlight and other, other such things. So if you go to a high rate sedimentation, so this is really the, the key of why you would go through the effort of, of thinking about the salts contact clarifier or, uh, or putting lamella plates in, you, you can move from roughly a meter and a half to somewhere more like in the seven and a half meter an hour on average, right? Um, and then for turbidity removal and if you're doing, again, color um, algae, you're going to have to drop that loading rate. Um, because the flock is going to be lighter and fluffier, fluffier and less less prone to settle, so um, you have to drop that down a little bit. But still, you can get kind of in the order of three to four times more loading rate than you could through a, just a conventional um, sedimentation basin. So, you know, a marked improvement in the performance, and still a, a fairly robust, uh, um, proven technology that uh, should work for many many years successfully for your for your operator. So. Yes, yeah, still like horizontal high rate sedimentation is still something that gets built, uh, you know, somewhat frequently, and uh, because of its simplicity and kind of ability to to provide reliable, consistent water quality. I think uh, with that, yeah. So I'll turn it back to Simon, who's going to give you a bit of a preview on uh, process selection and uh, you know really highlight or kind of introduce the uh, high rate processes and the benefits of them and be kind of a good prelude to the, the next session that you guys are going to get. Why? Thanks, Brett. Drag the ball over to me if you would. Yeah. How do I do this? Right. There you no. go. All right. Well, um, I, I started off this presentation. I started off this presentation talking about uh, um, the, the role of sedimentation in water treatment, and, and I said that most treatment plants, almost all treatment plants, uh, at least treating surface waters, have a clarifier or sedimentation basin in them, uh, and, and that's true. And, and, and 20, 30, 40 years ago that basin would invariably be a horizontal sedimentation basin, uh, pretty much. Um, but now, in this day and age, with more uh, variation in sedimentation processes, I, I wanted to do a couple of slides just to uh, give you a, a little bit of a sense for um, the, the best type of clarifiers for, for different uh, uh, um, source waters. And, and maybe we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves because I'm going to talk about some processes that come up in, in Lesson 5, um, but I think it's really important that you understand this. Um, and I'll start off uh, at, at the really high quality end um, because it's not always necessary that you need a sedimentation basin. Remember, 
sedimentation or clarification is there to protect your filters from excessive solid bloating. If you don't have, if you have a source water that's naturally very, very low in solids, uh, it, it is not always necessary to have a clarifier. Um, generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, um, if you're talking about averages, uh, that would be a water with an average turbidity less than 5 NTU and, uh, and a TOC or total organic carbon less than 3. Um, the organics are important because you might remember from lesson three that um, in most cases where you have moderate to high organics, um, it's the organics that actually dictate coagulant demand. And so if you have appreciable organics there, you're going to have quite a bit of coagulant you're needing to add to coagulate the water. If you add quite a bit of coagulant, you're going to generate a lot of solids. A lot of solids means you're going to plug your filters. And so. You can only really get away without using a clarifier if you have turbidity less than five on average, organics less than three on average. Um, moving up the scale a little bit, um, if you have a source water, um, and this is quite common, something you might see in a lake, for example, where you have a pretty low turbidity, say less than 10 on average, um, we will, the best fit probably is dissolved air flotation. And, and as the name infers, instead of allowing the solids to settle, you're actually floating them. And we're going to talk about this in great length in lesson five. But the reason flotation works well on sources like that is because if you imagine you're, you're treating a lake source, um, in most conditions, a, a lake is, is in effect a natural sedimentation basin. A lot of the heavy fraction solids will naturally settle in the lake itself, and the solids that are coming into the plant will be very light in nature. There will be particles that didn't settle in the lake, um, and if they're not going to settle that well in the lake, uh, you, you probably won't expect them to settle very well in a sedimentation basin. So flotation works well. Um, flotation also works pretty well even with a, a fairly high organics load because when you coagulate organics, uh, you tend to get a very light flock. And so it turns out flotation works really well. So flotation is, is good for um, low turbidity sources, um, but organics really there's no limit. You can also get away with using flotation in higher turbidity sources, typically up to maybe 100 NTU on average, but only in situations where the solids we're talking about are very light in nature. So again, you, you might see lakes that, that on a windy day you might see some, some higher solids, uh, maybe the lake bottom gets stirred up a little bit, you get some solids come in. If those solids are light fraction solids, kind of fluffy stuff, uh, DASH should be able to handle it no problem. But if you're getting into heavier stuff, uh, you're getting, you know, kind of heavier sediments being stirred up, then DAF isn't going to work very well. And then you're talking about using sedimentation or what we call active flow, which we're going to talk about in the next session. And then once you get up over, over say, 100 NTU, you're definitely, flotation is out completely, and you're certainly definitely, uh, at that point, using a sedimentation process or active flow. So that's on, under average conditions. I have the same uh, graph I, I mislabeled here. This isn't uh, average. This is actually worst case conditions. Um, direct filtration, yeah, 30, 30 NTU is pretty is pretty high. But but if you have a, a direct filtration plant and occasionally see the burp where there's maybe up to 30 NTU coming to the plant for a very short period of time, you can kind of run through it, um, and you're going to struggle during those times. The filter runs are going to be very short. But as long as that average is is less than five consistently, direct filtration may still be an effective thing to do. Um, DAF processes um, can, can handle, um, I, I've seen plants design up to 200 or even more. Again, it really it depends uh, heavily on the type of solids that you see coming into the plant. So the, a lot of the same rules apply. Um, so uh, direct filtration up to a peak of about 30. DAF up to a peak of around 200 as long as the solids are light. Anything above that, you're talking about settling or active flow. So just to summarize, um, sedimentation processes, the kind of processes we've spoken about today, are really best suited to uh, sources with heavier solids. Um, river sources are, are a good fit. Rivers tend to be naturally more flashy. Um, when they get flashy, the solids that are stirred up tend to be heavier in nature. Uh, and so we'll typically see sedimentation processes used on rivers. 
You might see them used on iron removal plants if you've got a very high iron load. Um, and you almost exclusively see them used on lime softening plants because lime settles very easily. It's kind of relatively uh, uh, heavy in nature compared to alum flock. And so lime softening plants are exclusively used sedimentation. And lime softening, as, as Brett spoke about, we typically run a lime softening plant. Um, so the hardness is pretty stable. We have a certain fixed lime dosage going in. Everything's kind of ticking along fairly constant, constantly. And so we see uh, a lot of plants, particularly in the Midwest of the US and Canada, uh, that, that use solid contact clarifiers and pulse blanket clarifiers um, on lime softening sources. There's even a lot of them on river sources, uh, and, and, and but they don't work very well if the, on river sources because they're too changeable. So there's been a lot of plants we've gone into over the years and, and either ripped out solid contact clarifiers or converted them to something else. And really getting to my key point is in this day and age, um, you almost never see a new high, uh, horizontal sedimentation basin built. I, I can't remember the last time I saw a new solid contact uh, clarifier or a blanket clarifier or a pulsated clarifier. Almost exclusively, if it's a new plant, we see either high rate sedimentation, we see dissolved air flotation, or we see active flow. One of those three things. They will give you uh, equal or better performance than the other techniques in a smaller footprint and usually at a lower cost. And so. That's really the, the overarching uh, um, message here uh, is that is that over the years there's 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 been a, a huge number of different clarification processes on the market, but the, uh, these days we're seeing a, 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 a fairly small number of those technologies kind of dominate the market. Uh, we're almost done here. Just uh, a few references. Um, I, I actually recommend uh, Dr. Carol Moore's book, uh, Integrated, I, I mistyped the title here, it's Integrated Design of War Treatment Facilities, I think is the full title. Uh, Susumu uh, is, is an incredible uh, resource. I, he's a good friend of mine, a mentor of mine. Uh, he's in his 90s now, but it's, he has like 60 or 70 years of treatment experience. Uh, his book is very practical in nature, um, and it's a good read. Um, but there's some other good ones as well. The Montgomery Watson book is, is really quite good, uh, as well as the AWWA books, uh, Treatment Plant Design and Water Quality and Treatment. I like the two AWWA books. They're available as, as e-books, so you can read them on your iPad if you have one of those. So it's kind of, kind of handy. And then last but not least is uh, Water Clarification Processes, Practical Design and Evaluation. That's a pretty old book by Herbert Hudson, but it's a very good one if you can get your hands on it. Um, so that's it. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, our next uh, session, as I've alluded to, is uh, we're going to stick on clarification, but we're going to talk about some of the newer variant processes, uh, specifically active flow, uh, dissolved air flotation, and then what we call infilter DAF, which is uh, flotation and filtration in the same box, uh, something you can get away with when you're floating solids instead of settling them. So. Um, that's it for today. I guess uh, I'll open the floor to any questions that uh, anybody might have. Uh, fire away. You can either just speak up or you can uh, use the chat function, or uh, if you're shy, you can contact us offline later. Any questions? No? We put everybody to sleep? All right. Uh, Kim, do you just want to have any closing comments about what comes next? Um, no, I think I'm good. Okay. Well, y you'll you'll get an email from Kim tomorrow doing the instructions on the quiz and and, uh, and all that good stuff as, as you're probably getting used to now. So uh, if there's no questions, we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. And uh, thank you guys for participating, and we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks uh, for Lesson 5.